Would you join with me and let's just bow our heads, close our eyes one more time. Let's go before the Lord in prayer today and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us in this place. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear your word tonight. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we get to come into the house of God. We don't come to hear from a man, from a woman. Lord, we don't come to hear from the old or the young. Lord, we come to hear from you. And we acknowledge that at the rock, it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this church. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask tonight that your Holy Spirit would be our counselor, would lead us, guide us, direct us, open up our eyes to see, our ears to hear your word, Lord. I thank you that you would open our hearts and our minds to comprehend and to grab a hold of what you want us to know, to understand, to do, and apply in our lives, that we walk out of this place tonight equipped and empowered to be exactly who you've called us to be, to do exactly what you've called us to do, that we might affect our families, our workplaces, uh, our friends for your kingdom, for your glory, Lord. And we give you that praise. We give you that glory, Lord. For all the churches that are having midweek services on a Wednesday night, on a Thursday night, on a Tuesday night, Lord, we thank you that you bless them as you bless us. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else here at The Rock, but we do acknowledge that we are co-laborers, members of the same body, the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And so, Lord, to you be the honor and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, you can thumb there, grab your phone, get out you version or whatever olive tree, whatever Bible reader you have. Bring your Bible to church. Bring a Bible on your phone, bring a Bible on a device, whatever it might be. Why? Because I don't want you just to come. We don't want you just to come and just to hear what a man has to say in referring to Scripture, but rather we want you to read it, see it for yourself. Don't ever take somebody's word uh, just at, at face value, but get into it, study it, live it, see what God wants you to do. But I have you turn to Exodus in the 15th chapter. Exodus in the 15th chapter is the moments after the greatest miracle, I believe, that we have ever seen on earth at the hand of God with the exception of one other, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is, I believe, the greatest miracle that we'd ever seen God perform in the Bible, and that is the crossing of the Red Sea, the, the miraculous crossing where God parted the waters of the Red Sea and the children of Israel crossed on dry ground, and the, the Egyptian army that followed them in pursuit were drowned in that very same sea. Now, the moments after that is what we want to look at today. Exodus in the 15th chapter, Exodus chapter 15, I want to read verse number 23 through 25, Exodus 15, 23 through 25, get rid of those, Exodus 15, 23 through 25, you guys there? Yeah. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter, therefore the name was called Mara. Now, you might have a little asterisk, I'm a little letter, my Bible has a little A right there. That word Mara literally means bitter. So now when they came to bitter, they couldn't drink the water because the water was bitter. bitter. All right, cool. We're all on the same page. I'm so glad. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Three days after the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, they'd seen the greatest miracle that the Bible would, would record with the exception of the resurrection of Jesus Christ after three days in the grave. Three days after the greatest miracle that they would see in the Bible. There they are with no source of water. There they are with no drinking. Now, if you know modern science, modern science tells us that the body can go about 40 days without food, but only three days without water before it begins to deteriorate and die. So here they are at the final moment, the last, the, the threshold of health. And here they are, and they come to a spring only to find out it's bitter water. A couple of months ago, in the month of February-ish, somewhere in there, there was a news report about Death Valley right here in California National Park. There was a super bloom. A super bloom is, is there was some rains that had happened almost a year previous that watered some seeds that were on the ground. And because those seeds had gotten a little bit of water about a year ago, when the season was right, these flowers out of, out of the ordinary bloomed in a place that is known and synonymous for death. So, of course, I dragged my family to Death Valley National Park on a Monday. I took my kids out there, and there they are sitting on the salt flats of Death Valley, uh, one of the hottest air temperature, excuse me, yeah, the hottest air temperature recorded on earth is only a couple hundred miles from where you 
live. 135 degrees recorded at Death Valley. So we took our kids to go see Death Valley. It was interesting. There was really nothing there but death. A couple of flowers on the side of the road and some salt. So as we were going through Death Valley, on the last day, we were only there for a couple of days. As we were going through Death Valley, we made it a point to drive through different areas. And as we were driving through Death Valley, we made it a point to want to go to one of the areas that Death Valley is famous for. And that's the area of Badwater Basin, it's called. Badwater Basin. It's the lowest point in uh, North America. 282 feet below sea level is Badwater Basin. And Badwater Basin is known for this great salt flat. You can see the white out in the distance. And those are salt flats that go in either direction for miles and miles and miles and miles. And it's amazing. It's a sight to see. It's really interesting to see the little hexagons that the, that the water creates in the, in the ground. But what surprised me when I got to Badwater Basin with my family was that in the hottest place on earth, in the most desolate place on earth, there is a natural occurring spring. Right there, in the middle of this salt flat. So I was amazed, I was intrigued by it, as, with, as, as are many, because obviously they built a dock or a little walkway across this spring. And so we went out there and we read the story of this spring known for its name, Badwater. A couple hundred years ago, a miner was crossing Death Valley, thirsty, dying of thirst, just like we read in Exodus. As he was crossing through Death Valley with his mules, he stumbled upon this naturally occurring spring. He was so excited and so relieved to see that there was respite from the heat of Death Valley, which in the winter time, when we're freezing at 45 degrees, Death Valley is still a balm 80 degrees. So there he was, and he led his mules to this spring, only to find out his mules refused to drink it. Why? He bent down, and he scooped up a, a handful of water, only to find out this was a saltwater spring. Useless, worthless for life. Here in one of the hottest places on earth is this spring, this naturally occurring year-round spring, that is known for its name, bad water. He called it bad water. Why? Because the water was bad. bad. Exactly. Just like we read in Exodus. The thing I want to talk about today is our lives. Because as we see this story of Exodus, as we think about things like bad water, naturally occurring springs that are, that are sediment collectors that all of the salt and all of the, the, the imperfections of earth as the water carries it and p p penetrates into the ground and then it comes back up. It comes through all of these uh, imperfections to become bad. I, I believe that this bad water that we see in Exodus, this bad water, I, as I was there, I, I got deep. My mom is known for, for going so deep in the most random of places. She'll see a star and start crying and talking about the goodness and the, and the majesty of God. Or there's a hummingbird over there and she's like, the hummingbird. And, and, and God spoke to her about the hummingbird or whatever it might be. And, and I had a moment when I was at Badwater with my kids because I saw a picture of humanity. You see, Genesis, when Moses accounts or recounts the, the creation of earth and the six-day creation, the sixth day or the final day of creation, in Genesis, the first chapter, it says that Moses writes it down and he says God is, he was conferring with the Holy Trinity, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says to himself, to the Trinity, he says, let us make man in our image. And then he says it like this, he says, let us create him in our image likeness. And see, I believe that bad water, I believe that Mara, the, 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 the spring that the children of Israel came to as an image, is a picture of humanity. When you see it from a distance and you begin to see that there's a well, when you begin to see that there's a spring, when you begin to see that there's water that gives life, that moves mountains, that, that, that the greatest force on the earth is water. You begin to see it and you say, there's hope. There's something here, but then as you get closer, you begin to realize that it might bear the reflection, it might bear the similarity, it might look the same on the surface, but when you begin to get deeper into the makeup of that water, you begin to realize that it, it is not the same. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle, as he's writing to the church in Rome, in Romans, the third chapter, verse number 23, Paul says it like this, he says, for all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody, every person, every last human being on earth has sinned. Why? Because God created humanity in His image. God created us in His likeness for His purpose and for His glory. But you and I, we know the story that Adam and Eve, they made that mistake, they slipped up and they messed up and then all of a sudden the water became tainted. We went from waters of life to tainted, bitter waters. And no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, no matter how, how much we try to, 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 to change the makeup of that water, we are the mirror of life, humanity. There's areas in your life that you recognize, you say, God, that's just bad water. That relationship is just bad water. That, 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 that hope, that dream, it's just bad water. That thing I keep dealing with on a constant basis, it's just bad water in my life. And it might look like it's beneficial, and it might look like it's good, and it might look like it's helpful, it might look like it brings life, but no matter what I do, it's bad water. It's useless to life and to growth. So Paul the Apostle paints this picture in Romans, and he says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'll show you a little picture that I thought of when I was thinking about it. I think it like this. I think God said, let us create man in our image. Let us build him, create him in our likeness. I think when you think of Jesus and water and the references of water in the Bible, I think, I think God said, let us create man like Fiji water. It's not arrowhead. It's not tap water. It's not zero water. It's not, you know, crystal geyser. This water's from Fiji, praise Jesus. <laughs> from an artesian. Well, when you go to the, to the store, right, you've seen it. You've been there before. You go to the store, and there's like Evian, and there's like Arrowhead, and then there's like, uh, you know, Aquafina, and there's all these brands. They're all like two for 99 cents, right? And then you get down to the bottom, Actually, it's probably the other way around. You get down to the top because you know what? They don't want your kids grabbing it. And then there's like Fiji. Yep. You're like, wait a minute. That water's two for 99 cents. That water's 2.99. Water is water, right? And then all of a sudden, crack open that Fiji water. Praise Jesus. I'm thirsty. Artesian water. Smooth. It just goes down easy. <laughs> if, if, if you're not, this is, you think it's a brand. You think it's a commercial, right? I should get money for this. If you don't even like water, you drink water like this and you'll like water. Because right. <laughs> it's just it's artesian water. It's just good stuff, right? God said, from the whole one. God said, let us make man in our image. Yep. And there we are, humanity. Created for a purpose. Your life designed for a purpose. But then something happened. Paul defines it and Paul tells us in Romans, the third chapter, for all. Have sinned. And so God had a purpose, God had a plan. But then what happens to our life? God sees the sin nature of man. And the water that God created, the image that God created, becomes tainted with sin and destruction. And now all of a sudden, the condition, the state of humanity, is tainted. What was created in the image of God, what was designed for a purpose, what was made for a reason, what God said, I have this image, I have this idea, I have this purpose in life. Now all of a sudden, sin crept into our lives and tainted us so that we were bitter, literally bitter with offense, bitter with hatred, Bitter with all sorts of different emotions and feelings. Bitter with circumstances. Useless. Having an image that reflects God, but not reflecting God any longer. Why? Because we are bad water. Whew. Bad water. But I love how it's not over when it just says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because you see, the Bible tells us in the very next verse of Romans, the third chapter, it says that God came 
in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, to justify us freely by his grace. Why? Through the redemption of Jesus Christ. You see, you and I, we're bad water in humanity. We're, we're, we're natural to it. We're just used to it. So what do we do? We see those things in life that we don't like about ourselves. We see the reactions that we have to our fellow human beings. We see the way we respond to our husband, to our wife. We see the way we respond to our children. We see the, resp the way we respond to circumstances. We see pain. We see dis disappointments. We see things in life and we see and we recognize that it is a bad water. Useless for life. And so what do we do as humanity? We try to make the bad water good again. Why? We try to do what we can to do it. We try to pour the sugar into the bad water. Praise the Lord for a black stage and white sugar. Amen. I'm going to keep going. Why? Because, you know what, you recognize, you know, I, I, I weigh more than I should, so I'm going to go on diet. You recognize, you know what, I'm, I, I miss Valentine's Day, so I'm going to buy my wife flowers more. You recognize, I'm just talking about myself, okay, so you don't even talk about it. You recognize all these things, so what do you do? You try to sweeten that water. 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 So that way that water could be usable again. Anybody want to try it? Let's see, I'll tell you. Hold on. Do you know that water tastes just the same as it did with salt in it? You see, we try to do everything we can to sweeten the waters of our life so that we can get back to the place, so that we can get back to the position, so that we can get back to the identity, so we can get back to the purpose that God created humanity for. So what do we do? We adopt things like religion. What do we do? We adopt things like mindsets. What do we do? We try to live a good life to add sugar to the bad water in hopes that it would make the bad water good water again. But guess what our efforts do? Nothing. Why? Because Exodus chapter 15, I believe, is an image. It is a type of a story of humanity and the position of God and the plan of God for our lives. Three days after the greatest miracle the earth had ever seen. They are ready to die because they have no water. And so it says in Exodus, it says that they came to this place and they named it Mira. Why? Because the waters were bitter. They could not drink the waters. And they cried out to Moses and against Moses after three days saying, Moses, why did you bring us here to die? And Moses cries out to God, God, what are you doing? And the Bible says that God showed Moses a tree could be literally translated a piece of wood on the floor of a desert. And Moses took that piece of wood and he threw it into the water. And instantly, what was bad water became, once again, good water, sweet water, useful water, tasty water. Mm. Praise Jesus for this water. And that verse, that story, is a representation of humanity in Jesus. You see, the Bible talks about the cross and refers to the cross as a tree. And the Bible says that God showed Moses a tree. To you and I, that tree in our bad water is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. We all have areas, even right now as we speak in our lives, where we are living bad water. But Jesus is the only thing that will take your bad water and make it fresh water. Yeah. Humanity has tried for millennia with religion, with philosophical ideas, with higher platforms of thought to sweeten the bitter waters of our condition. But we have found over thousands of years that no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, no matter how much of a resolve we have, we can never make our own water sweet again. Why? Because God showed Moses a tree 
And God showed humanity a cross. And he said, you want the bitter waters of your life. What are those bitter waters? Maybe those bitter waters are the emotional state that you're in. Maybe the bitter waters are the condition of your children. Maybe the bitter waters are the, the condition of your relationship. Maybe the bitter waters are the circumstances that you're going through, the pain and the anguish that you're feeling right now. And God says, you see, you feel, you experience the bitter waters of life. And the only way to make the bitter water fresh again is not by your own efforts of pouring sugar and sweetness into the bitter water, but by taking the tree, the cross of Jesus Christ, and putting it into the situation, the circumstance, the pool of bitter water in your life, and allowing Jesus Christ to make it fresh water again. See, it's so simple that we overlook it on a daily, regular basis. We've got to see the tree. See the tree. What is the tree? The tree represents the cross. See the cross of Jesus Christ in the middle of your bitter water. Circumstance that you're feeling in that state that you're living in is bitter water. Death to you if you continue to drink it. But if you see the tree... Jesus Christ and do what Moses did and put the tree into the water the piece of wood on the floor of a desert to pick it up and put it in the water see I believe in that story as it says in Exodus the 15th chapter he cried out to the Lord and so the Lord showed Moses a tree and when when he cast it into the waters the waters were made sweet there he made a statute and ordinance for them and then these things he tested them. See, I believe in Jewish tradition even says it like this, that the tree that Moses cast in by nature itself was bitter. And as a representation of Jesus Christ, the bitter suffering and the bitter ending of Jesus' life combined with the bitter circumstances and situation of humanity combined together to make the water sweet again. But you see, I believe that the tree whether it was a stick on the ground, whether it was a tree living and they had to chop it down, I believe that the tree itself had no difference in the makeup of the water. I believe that it was Moses' action of following God's word and his obedience to God that God blessed those waters and changed the makeup of the tree. You see, the cross is always there. The cross has been there for 2,000 years. You think about it like this, in the story of Exodus, they arrived at the waters. It didn't say that God created a tree. It didn't say that God caused a tree to grow up out of the ground. It said God showed Moses the tree. The tree was already there. The solution was already in front of Moses. Moses just didn't see it. Why? Because so often what happens in life, we deal with the bitter waters of life. And we try to add sugar and we try to add different things to make it up in our life. We try to live a good life. We try to say good things to people, hoping that it would make our bitter water sweet again. And we overlook the plan, the purpose, the remedy for our situation. It's simply just to see the tree. To see the tree. To see the cross of Jesus Christ in your bitter water. Pastor Luke, so what are you saying? Look at Jesus in my, in my hardship? Wow, whoop de doo I've heard that message a thousand times. What areas of your life, what areas of my life are we overlooking the remedy of the tree as we try to do everything we can on our own to make that bitter water sweet again? I can tell you, this past year of my life, I have been so blessed. My kids are healthy. I've had more comforts in my life than I've ever experienced in my own. But something on the inside of me has churned up angst. I have experienced some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows that I have ever felt in my life. And I believe that there's a season in my life where God has allowed things to come upon me, things to, to come against me in my own life on the inside so that I would come to the recognition of my bitter water and just like you, just like me, just like every other person on earth, when we face bitter waters, we do everything we can 
to come up with a remedy. You've even heard the phrase, we'll throw the kitchen sink at the bitter water, hoping to make it sweet again, only to find out we run out of solutions. And when we run out of solutions, God says, look up. Look up. Look up. There in my own life, over the course of about 10 months, I've experienced things I've never experienced before. I've experienced things I've never thought I could experience. Depths of places that I didn't know physically a Christian could get to. And as I throw the kitchen sink at it, and everything I do in my own life, I say, I've got to get rid of this pain. Now I'm left with nothing else except to realize and recognize the only answer to the bitter water of my life is Jesus Christ. The only answer to the bitter water of your life is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how hard you try to make it better. You'll never make any difference. But like Moses, God showed him the solution. Simply put, we have to see the tree in our lives. But it's so obvious, just like Moses, that you pass by the tree, you pass by the cross. But Pastor Luke, I come and I give my life to Jesus. I worship like I never worship. And when it comes to the big things in my life, my kids and my health, I'm going to give it to Jesus. But what are the areas of your life that you're overlooking of bitter water? Not seeing the tree in that. Well, that's, that's not big enough. God doesn't, God doesn't care about that. That's not important. It's, it's insignificant in my life. Where in your life are you overlooking? Or where in your life do you need to see the tree, the remedy, the cross of Jesus Christ in your life? You say, well, Pastor, look, I don't have any areas of my life. Well, praise God, you're either one of two things. You're in extreme denial. <laughs> or secondly, you are in the wrong seat because you should be up here and I should be down there. Praise the Lord. Yeah, Why? Because we all have. Come on, let's be honest. Can we be real? We all have areas, significant or insignificant, that we're not seeing the tree. And we're throwing everything we can at it, pouring sugar in the bottle, trying to make it better. When God says, look up and see the tree. I mean, think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Bitter water. Don't you think it's odd that three days after the greatest miracle on earth, except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, three short days, Moses wrote a song about it. And as soon as Moses is done writing the song, they come to bitter water. A hopeless situation. Why? Why would God take them through the plagues of Egypt and keep them? Why would God take them to the edge of the Red Sea and deliver them? Why would God take them into the wilderness and the very first place they arrive once they've seen the miraculous deliverance of God is to bitter water? Why? Perhaps, perhaps it's that God lets us get to the place of bitter water in our lives to recognize that there is better water for us. Would they have responded to God? Would they have trusted God? Would they have known or been grateful for what they were about to encounter if they had not gotten to the place to recognize that there was bitter water? It says it like this in, in, in Exodus, the 15th chapter. It says that when Moses threw the tree in the water there, it was made sweet. And then it says, he made, he, God, made statutes for them. And it says, and there he tested them. God allowed them to experience bitter water, bad water, so that he could see their response in life. Think about it like this. There's this amazing story in John 15th chapter, and I'll just finish with this thought. It's the thought tonight. Jesus is walking through Samaria. It's an outcast area. Jews hate the Samaritans. They're just reprobates to the Jews. 
And there Jesus arrives at this village in Samaria in the middle of the day, the heat of the day. If you've ever been anywhere other than America, Latin America, some of the more hotter regions of the world, during the middle of the day, nobody does anything. Why? You know why, because we live in San Bernardino. Why? Because it's hot. And so in the middle of the day, everybody goes home. They take a siesta. And everybody's out there on a siesta, waiting for the day to cool down so they can resume their work. And Jesus, at, the, at exactly the right moment, the orchestrated time of God, goes and he sits down on a well. And there's a woman who comes by. And Jesus looks to this woman and he says, get me some water, I'm hot. And she says, sir, you have no bucket to get water from. And Jesus says this amazing statement to her in John the fourth chapter. Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of the water I give to them will thirst again. Are you drinking this water? You're going to thirst again. He says it like this. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, he will never thirst. But the water I shall give shall become in him a fountain of life springing into everlasting life. Do I have verse number 15 on there? Yes, no, no, I guess not. That's it. And so she says, sir, I'd like a sip of this water. And Jesus begins to say something to her. He says, go get your husband. And we'll come back and talk about this water. And amazingly, she responds back to Jesus and she says, well, sir, I have no husband. And Jesus says back to her in this conversation, he says, you're white. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And the man that you're with right now is not your husband. I believe right then Jesus orchestrated something so miraculous. He brought that lady, that woman, to a place in her life that she had already known about. But he exposed to her the fact that she had been living with bitter water. And he said, go get your husband. He knew. And he said, you need to know. You've got bitter water. She says, I don't have a husband. That's right. You've had five and now the guy you're with is not your husband at all. You, you've got really bitter water. And now all of a sudden, she comes to the place where she recognizes, I need fresh water. And so Jesus primes the pump. And it was because of that encounter that an entire Samaritan village came out to see and to hear the words of a Jewish rabbi who was sitting at the well on a hot day because he brought her to the place of recognition. There's bitter water in your life, but I've got fresh water that I want to give to you. And when you start drinking the water that I give to you, when you see the tree, when you see the cross, and you apply it to that circumstance, when you apply it to that season, when you apply it to those emotions, when you apply it to that relationship, when you apply it to that, that place in your life, all of a sudden, like the children of Israel, that tree begins to change the chemical makeup of that water, and that water goes from bitter water to fresh water. Church, see the tree. See the tree. Stop overlooking the resource that God has given to you and I in the cross of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. And if nothing else tonight, what are you talking about, Pastor Luke? I don't know. I just know this. That there's a lot of people on earth, you and me included, that have areas of bitter water that we're tired of living in. And if we would just stop for a moment and see the solution of Jesus Christ. And see and recognize that it's only Jesus that can turn the bad water of our life into fresh water for him. Then we would live and we would operate. And we would go to the places that God wants us to go. Because you know the amazing thing about the story of, of, of Mara? The Bible tells us in verse number 26, verse number 25 and 26, I think it is. 26 says, I... I, if you diligently, this is the test, God says, if you listen to what I say, 
You won't have to deal with the plagues of Egypt in your life. It goes on verse the second part of that. He says, I'll put none of these diseases on you, for I am the Lord who heals you. And look what the next verse, two verses after this story say. Verse number 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And they camped there. See, God had to bring them. God had to lead them to the bitter water first before he could take them to the better water of life. God with the Samaritan woman on the well, he had to bring her to the place of recognition of the bitter water in her life before he could bring her to the better waters of life. And so we cry out in these circumstances. We cry out and we say, God, take this pain. Take this circumstance. Take this situation. Take these emotions. Take what's going on and remove it from me. And God says, let me lead you to the bitter water so that you can recognize and see that there's a tree to put in your water so that I can take you to the better waters of your life. And God doesn't want you to camp at the bitter water, the bad water. God wants to bring you. He wants to bring me. He wants to bring people who have no concept, no idea that there is bitter water in their life. He wants to bring them to a place of better water. But until we see the tree in our lives, until we stop and open our eyes and see the cross of Jesus Christ in every area of your life, big and small, we'll live in the bitter waters. But when we see the tree and we see the resurrection power we see the grace of God in our lives we put the tree in our circumstance and God says I'm going to take that bitter water and I'm going to make it fresh water and I'm going to take you from fresh water to fresh water to fresh water to fresh water but we've got to open our eyes and see the tree the cross of Jesus Christ and stop trying to throw the sugar at the water, but throw the cross. Throw the cross. What Jesus did for you, what Jesus did for me to allow that bitter water to become fresh water in our lives so that somebody would look at you, so that somebody would look at me, and they would say, whatever it was that you were dealing with, God has brought you through it. And it seems to me like you're drinking Fiji water. There's a glow about your skin. There's an alkaline presence of you. You just seem happier. You seem thinner. Did you lose weight? And you and I, we can reply like Jesus did at the well. You know, I was living in a place of bad water. But I found Jesus. And I took the cross of Jesus Christ and I put it into my water. And Jesus took my bad water and he made it fresh water. And he took that fresh water and he put it on the inside of me so that no matter how much I drink of it, it doesn't run out. Why? Because he has given to me a fountain of everlasting life just like Jesus has given a fountain of everlasting life. Just like God took them from bad water to better water, Jesus wants to take you from your bad water to fresh water. We've got to see the tree. See the tree. Stop trying to come up with your own solution. Stop trying to come up with your own answer. Throw the cross at it. Stop throwing the kitchen sink at it. Throw the cross at it. That is the only thing that will make your bad water become fresh water in your life. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. Lord, Maybe tonight didn't make any sense. Lord, maybe to those or the one in here, the one at home, it made all the sense. Lord, I pray that as we're honest with ourselves, we look around at our lives and we examine, we recognize that there's areas of bad water. There's areas that no matter how hard we try, we can't seem to escape. Lord, I pray that you would help. Just as you opened the eyes of Moses to the tree or the wood that was already there, God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the cross that is already there that is already the price that has already been paid, that we would take that cross and we would put it into the bad waters of our life. 
And we would see you begin to change that water to become sweet and fresh and useful and functional. Lord, we recognize and we acknowledge that we go through things in life and we don't understand why we go through things in life. And Lord, sometimes you lead us to bad water before you take us to better water. And God, I pray that there are those of us in the season, maybe they're in a season today where they're in a place of bad water and they're asking and they're crying out to God, God, why am I here? And I pray that as we take the cross of Jesus Christ and we apply it to that circumstance, we apply it to that season, we apply it to that relationship, we apply it to that emotion, God, I pray that you would begin to change that bad water and you would begin to reveal your plan, your desire, your purpose for us to take us and to lead us to the better waters of life. And use that as a vessel for us to see in every area, in every aspect. Jesus is the answer to our, our problems. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us as we walk out of this place. Minister to those who need ministering tonight. Your love, your mercy, and your grace, and your desire for them to move from the bad water they're living in to the better waters of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Before we leave, before we leave tonight, I'm going to just take a minute or two, just a couple, couple minutes. I promise I'll let you out in just a couple minutes. Don't, don't get up, don't leave. It's very important, don't leave. The Bible says that a man should examine himself from time to time. I want you just to take a moment and be honest with yourself. Take a look at your life. Ask yourself this question. If I was to die tonight, would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? It's a sobering question. But you see, the Bible is very clear. There's only one of two options that you and I have to face. The Bible says that it's appointed once for man to die and then to face judgment. What are you going to see and account for in your life? Are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? Well, Pastor Luke, I just don't know if I believe in that. I believe that I'm going to come back as a frog or a log or a dog or whatever else. No, I just haven't landed on that. Listen, let me just tell you something. The Bible tells us it's a real place. The Bible tells us that God speaks of it. Jesus Christ himself speaks of it. It's real enough for God to write it, real enough for God to speak it, real enough for the word of God to be preserved, and then reconfirmed thousands of years later so that you and I could take it serious. Listen, we're all one accident, we're all one incident, we're all one epidemic away from our eternal destiny. And you are the master of your eternal destiny. Because what you do here determines what happens there. And so often people think, well, you know what, if I just think... If I just hope, if I just have a positive outlook on life, man, I really want to go to heaven. I really hope so. I think so. If I go to church, if I give myself a title, if I carry a card in my wallet that says I'm a member of a church organization, if I do good things, if I get baptized or if I get christened or if I get confirmed, if I give to charitable organizations or to the church, I'm going to go to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible... Does it say that because you have a positive outlook on life? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian growing up. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were christened or baptized as a baby. Nowhere does it say that because you're a member of a church organization. Nowhere does it say that because you attend on a regular basis. Listen to this. Nowhere does it even say that because you're a good person, because you think you're going to do good and be good and it'll all, it's all good. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that any of those things are the path to heaven. Oh, but Pastor Luke, you know what, I, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I, mean, I have a heightened sense of spirituality, and I recognize that there are powers at work that are greater than I am. I don't want to affiliate. I don't want to get a hold of anything and call myself this or that, but I believe that, you know, we'll all kind of find the same. Listen, can I tell you something? The Bible's very clear. A sense of spirituality is not going to get you into heaven. Jesus says it like this. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He says no one goes to the Father except through him. So let's establish how do we find ourselves in connection and position with God, how we read in Romans, the third chapter, verse number 24, who were, were freely justified by the grace of Jesus Christ to be redeemed to God. How, how do we get to that position? How do we get to that place? Jesus Christ makes it very clear. He says in John, the third chapter, he says it like this. He says, in order to inherit the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. What is an inheritance? An inheritance belongs to those who are within. See, the Bible refers to you and I. The Bible says that we're window shoppers. We're on the outside looking in, born into sin, saying, man, I'd really like to have something like that. But God says, Jesus Christ came to take us from the outside to the inside. How do we get from the outside to the inside? He says to be born again. What does born again mean? 
Hollywood society's made it out to be a mockery. Think of that weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. But listen, let me tell you something. Born again from the beginning of God's word to the end of God's word has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. It's not about a mental ascent or a carnal knowledge of who he is. You can know all about Jesus. You can know about where the books of the Bible are. You could quote scripture. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet that's not the formula for them to get into heaven. Listen, I know the president's name. I know the president's middle name. I know the president's last name. I know the address in which the president of the United States currently resides. I even know his daughter's names and his dog's names. But did you know that he's never once called me on the phone and invited me to dinner at his house? Because you can know all about somebody and completely miss out on a personal relationship with them. And there are far too many people thinking that just because they know about Jesus, because they have a casual church attendance, because they pray a token prayer, because somebody told them some course in their life, because they got a cross around their neck or because they got a tattoo on their body, that that means that, you know what, that means everything's good between me and God. When Jesus says these words in the book of Revelation, speaking to the church, you and I, he says, listen, I'm watching. I know your works. I know you. And he says, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, listen, I will vomit you from my mouth. It's a shocking phrase. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They'll be rejected. They'll be ejected, expelled from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Simply put, lukewarm means this. It means that you've given God some of your heart, but not all of it. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're doing some of the, the right things, but you know you're doing some of your own things. You're riding the fence, occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing, doing whatever, playing the game on Sunday or Wednesday night, coming to church, you know how to speak Christianese, and then you go back to work and you do your own thing. Listen, let me love you enough and respect you enough to tell you today to tell you the truth. I've been open, I've been honest about myself. I've got nothing to hide, but we've got heaven to gain. That living a life of lukewarm, a casual Christianity is not going to get you into heaven with God. Why? Because God didn't send Jesus Christ to die. Listen, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't quick. It wasn't fun. It wasn't glamorous. He didn't send his only begotten son to carry a cross to his death place so that he could nail, be nailed to a cross and sit there and be tortured. So the Bible says that, that Jesus became sin, not like sin, became sin for you and for me. So that when God looked upon us, he no longer saw sin, but he saw Jesus. He didn't do that so that you, cannot, you and I could live a casual life and just kind of hope everything's right. He did that so that you and I could live a fully committed life. And it's not even so much about what happens when you and I die. God said, Jesus said these words, the thief doesn't come to your house except to steal your things, to kill you, and to destroy your life. But Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. You see, there's an emptiness on the inside of you, a bitter water that you've been trying to throw sugar at it all your life. You know exactly what you're capable of. But yet, no matter how much sugar you pour into the bad water of your life, no matter what you do, you can't make it good. Why? Because only Jesus Christ can take the bad water of our life and make it fresh water again. And maybe today it's time for you to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ. The invitation, yes, in that same scripture, Jesus says these words. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, and whoever comes to open the door... I will come in, Jesus says, and I will dine with them. I'll have dinner with them, and they'll have dinner with me. We're going to be in connection and relationship together. I believe right now that the Spirit of God, through the course of the Word, through the course of the worship, all throughout the night, the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now, knocking on the door of your heart, saying, you've come to the place of recognition that you've got bitter water. Are you going to throw the cross of Jesus Christ into the bitter water of your life to allow him to bring you to the place of fresh water today? Jesus is the only thing that will turn your bad water into fresh water. And the decision comes from you and you alone. You're the master of your own destiny. Nobody can make you. Your husband, your wife can't make you or wish for you. You are in control. Will you open up the door of your heart? Will you respond to the invitation right now of the Holy Spirit in your life to accept and to receive Jesus into your heart and your life? The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He won't force his way or make his way. It's your choice today. Who should give your heart? Who should give their life to Jesus Christ? If you've never given your heart, never given your life to Jesus, if that's you, just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure, listen, Paul the Apostle talks about it in the book of Acts. He says, God did not come. God does not want you to walk around the course of your life, walking around in the darkness, hoping that you might find what you're looking for. God says, literally, Jesus Christ came to turn on the light in your life that you would know without a shadow of a doubt who you are and where you stand with God. 
If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, listen, today is a day of your salvation. You've had doctors, you've had dentists, and you've had a div- now you've had a divine appointment tonight between you and God. And here's what I'm asking everybody to do. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, all, every person in this place, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want to give you, for the moment, a gift of privacy and of intimacy with God. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Let's all do it together. I want you to shut out everything that you're thinking about right now and think about that very question in your life. Where do I stand with God? All across this auditorium, close your eyes, bow your heads. Give that person next to you the gift of intimacy with God. And as you ask yourself that question, here's what I'm going to do. Jesus said these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. He says, but if you deny him, he will deny you. Today I'm going to do something. As your heads are bowed and as your eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. I'll smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And if that's you in this place and you say right now, honestly, if you could look at your heart, look at your life, you say, you know what? I feel like the Spirit of God is inviting me to come back to Jesus. I feel like God is knocking on the door of my heart saying it's time for me to throw the cross of Jesus Christ into my bad water. I want you to do something real bold. In just a moment, we'll do it together. I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing is you're saying, you know what, I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. You see, I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. And right after that, what we'll do together is we'll pray a prayer of salvation together. So you can give your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ. But what you're doing today is you're saying, I want to make that decision today to follow Jesus wherever you're at, whatever walk of life you're in. The Spirit of God is speaking to you today. The question is, will you respond to the invitation of the Holy Spirit to give your heart and to give your life to Jesus Christ today, to find life in Jesus? It's your choice, your call. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, front row, back row, if you're at home watching on the live stream, this is your opportunity as well. Wherever you are, this is your moment, this is your time. I'm going to count to three, and if I do, as I do, if that's you, with everybody's heads bowed, eyes closed, you pop your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down, and we'll go forward together. From there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see you guys in the back over there. About five wise people. I see that hand way over there in the back. I see you over here. I see you way over there in the back row. I see you, my man. If that's you in this place today, you pop your hand up. Say, man, I wonder if I should. Yes, you should. Anybody else in this place today? I see you, my man. I see that hand back over there on the side. The Spirit of God's knocking on your heart right now. Be open and be honest. Will you respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ in your life right now? That's you. Pop your hand up so I can see it. I won't embarrass you. I'm here to build you up. Anybody else in this place today? About eight, nine wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Let's give a praise for those that have responded today, making the decision to follow Jesus. Now here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, my friend Elijah over here, He's going to sing a song, and as Elijah sings a song, if you raise your hand, you're making a decision. You know this, and I know this. Every decision without action is no decision at all. Nothing will ever change. So if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend of you need a friend, and everybody's going to stand, and as everybody stands, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle, and come meet me right here at this altar, because we're going to change destinies together. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. If you raise your hand, If you responded to the invitation of Jesus Christ, now it's time to follow through today. And if that's you in this place, get out of your seat, get out of your chairs. We all stand together and Elijah sings. If that's you in this place today, you come and meet me right here. Let's change destinies together right here, right now. That's you. Come on. Just hang out right here, buddy. That's you. Come on, you come. If that's you, if you raise your hand, come on, the Spirit of God's calling you. Respond to Jesus today. From all over the place, they're coming. If that's you, come on. This is your moment. This is your time. Come on, you come. Well, praise God, you guys came. Listen, you know what? You might have a life full of bad choices and bad water. 
But you know what? Today, what you're doing, you're saying, I'm going to take the cross of Jesus Christ and I'm going to put it in my bad water and I'm going to let him change everything about my life. You're making the wisest, best decision you possibly can. And maybe you've never had anybody tell you this or maybe you've never had anybody tell you today, but let me be the first person today to tell you, good job, good job, doing a good job, good job, good job, guys. I'm going to receive life in Jesus Christ. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray a prayer together. Now listen, God doesn't listen to the words of your mouth like you repeat some abracadabra magical formula and everything's good between you and God. He doesn't listen to the words of your mouth. He listens to the prayers of your hearts. So I'm going to say some things. I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. You're just going to say a couple of words. You follow after me. You repeat them after me. And you believe them with your heart. The Bible says and confess them. Use your mouth to say them. And God listens to that. He sees that and he acknowledges that. So here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray a prayer of salvation together. I'm going to ask everybody in the place today, would you join with me? Let's all pray together. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, or you didn't come forward and you, and you should have, this is your opportunity right now to give your heart, to give your life to Jesus. If you're still watching online, this is your opportunity to pray along with us and give your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask everybody in this place to pray after me. I'll just, simple, easy words. You follow, follow along with me. If you miss a word or change a word, it's okay. All right? Believe it with your heart. Confess it with your mouth. And let's say this together. Let's all bow our heads one more time. Close our eyes. Go before the Lord in prayer. And everybody repeat this after me. Father God. Father God. Everybody, come on. Father God. Father God. I come before you today. I you. And I acknowledge that I need you. Today, I make the commitment to give my life to Jesus Christ. I believe in my heart that He is the Son of God, that He came and walked on this earth, and that He died on a cross for my sins. Today, I make the commitment to follow Jesus. I give my heart, I give my life to You. I leave my past behind. I ask that You forgive me of my sin cleanse me of my unrighteousness and I dedicate my future to you. I am saved today. I'm leaving hell behind. I'm headed for heaven. Fill me today with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, guys. Great job. Here's what we want to do. We don't want you to leave this place empty-handed. You're going to start a journey with us. We're all on a journey together. You're going to start a journey. And here's what we want to do. We want to get you equipped to start this journey and to run this race the right way. And so we see my friend over here waving at you. His name's Pastor Joel. Here's what he's going to do. Nothing weird goes on. I promise. You can see I've got rainbow colored socks on and white pants after Labor Day. I'm as weird as you're going to get. All right? Salt all over the stage. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys right over. He's going to give you some free information to help equip you to get on the right path in the right direction. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce somebody to you tonight that will get connect, that you can get connected with at church that will meet with you, teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks to get you strong in the ways of God. If you come on a Sunday, they'll buy you a cup of coffee or some french fries in our cafe. Teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to your life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has for you. And if you need prayer in your life, I'll tell you what, they'll pray for you today, all right? So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over to my friend, Pastor Joel.